Great to be here. So uh, this is indeed my third venture back company. Uh, this one worked out quite well. I'm not shy about talking about the fact that the others didn't do quite as well. Um, so, but I've been in the DC area now since I graduated from George Washington. And I ran a company out here in Virginia for a decade that produced a really successful PBS show. Unfortunately, the show did really well. The business didn't. So eight years into that, that company's history, I had 100 employees. And I had the unfortunate experience of putting 80 in one room and 20 in the other and laying off the 80. Uh, so the reason I start there is just you know my, my professional career is a journey through the DC area of a lot of failures before I got to what fortunately today is a pretty incredible company. So I happen want to start a little earlier. Um, you are from South Florida originally. Oh yeah, I hear so you're I, a Dolphins fan. Uh, so I uh, I was in unfortunately I was in Denver uh, last weekend for the 39 to 36 loss to the Broncos with my two boys who I've turned into as insane Dolphins fans as I am. So we're like, we're the three Dolphins fans in DC, basically, the only three. And I will be at the Dolphins-Ravens game this weekend. So yes, I'm a crazy Miami Dolphins fan, one of the few. Right, and what brought you up to, to GW? Why did you select GW? Uh, so George Washington, you know, not to play the violin for myself, but I'm a first generation college student. Uh, one of the reasons I love what 2U does is when I got to DC, I'd never seen snow. Uh, strangely bought my first winter coat with the person that is now my general counsel. True story. Uh, so freshman year, I didn't own a winter coat, went to Hex downtown in DC at the time, which isn't there anymore, obviously, and bought my first winter coat of my life. And the reason I start there is, you know, GW changed my life in every possible way. I could, you know, I could not have had a more profound impact of sort of opening the world to me. And the DC area really had a huge, uh, huge role in that. Just uh, the exposure that GW gave me to the world. Uh, I met my wife there. We're together 24 years later. Like, just it's pretty incredible what a high quality American degree did for me. And so that's one of the reasons I love, uh, I love 2U. But ultimately, uh, why DC at the time? You know, I honestly thought that I might be president of the United States. Like, I was all focused on politics, uh, have since gotten off that path. Uh, but really was totally enamored with the notion of being here in the nation's capital and couldn't have paid off more for me personally, so. And did you start, uh, is it Cerebellum? Cerebellum. Cerebellum, which was your PBS, sort of the show. Did you start that right out of college? Or did I you did, work? so yeah. I worked very briefly, which ends up connecting back to my career for a US senator. Mm -hmm. uh, had no connection to the state of Maryland, begged for a job, I literally got on my knees in People forget how bad the job market was in 92. And I literally got on my knees in the lobby, uh, the receptionist, and I, I begged for a job. And they gave me the job of assistant scheduler, which I think is funny because it is the worst job on the Hill. Because the scheduler takes all the yeses. So as assistant scheduler, all you do is say no all day. Now, 20 you know, plus years <laughs> later, what I realized you know, is if you get really good at saying no, it's incredibly useful. But nonetheless, so I did that job for a while, and then I started cerebellum while I was still working for Senator Mikulski. And what I would say, if you know anything about Barbara Mikulski, regardless of your politics, I can tell you that probably one of the most important days of my, of my life, I walked in after resigning, and I walked in the next morning, and there was a wax sealed Senate envelope on my desk, and I opened it up, and there was a personal check from her, and she became my third investor in that first company. And you know, Barbara Mikulski does not come from wealth, so really incredible moment for me. So every quarter, I would go up on the hill, and I would just tell her what was going on, having nothing to do with the hill. And eventually, when I, when we, when I exited that company, uh, she asked me to come run her campaign. So that's how I ended up getting briefly back into politics. I ran her campaign for a year and a half. Uh, would never do it again. I'm thrilled I did it. Uh, sort of fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I'd say the interesting thing about a campaign, if, if as, an, as an entrepreneur, and there's so many great entrepreneurs in the room, you could probably relate to this, a campaign You'll never find anything that finite, I don't think, where that's sort of why people get hooked on it like a drug, because you build up this massive thing, and then the next day, all I had to do was go get the signs. Like, that's it. That's the only job left at the right. end. The opposite go get of the running signs. a public company, exactly. probably. Um, but so Cerebellum, would you call that a failure or was a success? How would you characterize it? So there are a lot of people at 2U today that were with me at that company. And um, I don't, you know, clearly I'm very comfortable saying that as a business it was, it was not a success. And the reason is it didn't return capital to the shareholders. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't make people money. Now today right. it still operates. It's based in San Francisco. It's a profitable company today. Oh. It's still being run. Um, but, you know, from my experience, 
you know, it's a very hard lesson of the power of focus. It, you know, we produced a, a PBS television show, some of you might have heard of it, it's called Standard Deviance. It's middle school, high school, and college courses presented by comedians. Uh, and the show did very well, probably the hallmark of the show, a couple of funny things. In the year 2000, it was selected by TV Guide and Today Show as the top show for kids. And its biggest claim to fame is, uh, if there are any Scandal fans in the room, Kerry Washington, I gave her her first acting job, which is pretty funny. So um, she was in a bunch of the Standard Deviant shows. But the business itself had gotten, uh, you know, I think if you look back at it today, if the web existed at the time, we would have had a clear distribution path. And it was really challenging. You put something on TV and you sell stuff. And we sold over 5 million DVDs. Mm. The lesson learned is you've got to sell a lot of DVDs when you know, Target's taken 60%. So it's very difficult to turn that into a sustainable operation. And I had many opportunities to stay focused and really, as a young entrepreneur, learn the difficult lesson of the bright, shiny object. You know, the, as an entrepreneur, you often can't help yourself. I feel like it's um, dating myself here, but in the movie Poltergeist, when the little heavy set lady is saying, Carol Ann, don't go into the light. You know, <laughs> entrepreneurs can't, you go into the light, you see this new thing, and you go. And your whole career is built on not saying no, right? You won't take the no. Right. So uh, that has completely extended to to you. I will not take credit for everything at to you, but I will definitively take credit for keeping us focused. And that's just born out of failure, frankly. You know, let's talk about failure. I want to talk about Hooked on Phonics, and obviously to you too. But I, in watching a couple of your videos and seeing you speak before, you do talk about focus. And um, you know, focus. There's a balance, right, between you want to be opportunistic, but you also want to focus. How do you focus on the right things? How have you set this up internally? Because as an entrepreneur myself, and I'm sure as, as other entrepreneurs have um, sort of ch you know, struggled with staying focused but staying open, how do you do that uh, right now? You know, it, it, when I talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs. What I, what's interesting about this room for me is there's many people in the room that I've you know, had time with over my career. So it's, it's a fascinating room for the, for the really young entrepreneurs. You know, one of the things I say is Sergey Brin can go build the self-driving car, right? Yes. He, he made the most successful business model in human history. So it's about the business model to me. So it's not, you know, about innovation. Like at 2U, we have to innovate all the time, but we really figured out early on that we had a great business model. And we believed in it, and we just drove it, and we focused on it. And I would say that's where I think you can really get yourself into trouble because if you're constantly focusing on, if you're not focusing on that business model, uh, it's easy to sort of innovate yourself to death by continuing to drive some new product opportunity that really does require an entirely separate business model. So the best example of it for 2U is the number of times that I'm at something like this and people inquire about some aspect of, uh, it actually just happened this morning, some aspect of a business where 2U's model is appropriate but it would really require us to have an entirely different set of, of you know, business model principles. Uh, we're going to leave that to the three U's, four U's, and five U's. You know, we're, we're going to build the world's best online degree programs. That's what we do. We work with great colleges to do it. And it's working incredibly well. And it's pretty rare to find this kind of organic growth potential if you put capital to work. I happen to believe 2U is a rare company whose first act can be a billion in revenue. I think that's really unusual. and so. We're not going to let it go. And I guess uh, the challenge is you've got to find that business model first. Mm -hmm. So as a young entrepreneur. So you're iterating, you, I assume. And right? I had to pivot. I mean, you know, the pivot, got, good Lord, I pivoted to death at, at, at Standard Deviance. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, I was like Will Chamberlain. I was constantly moving. <laughs> so, um, you know, until you find the right business model, you have to. But once you do, I would really caution uh, younger entrepreneurs to stay focused on it until you really get some real traction. You know, we're, we're just now starting to put some chips down, uh, and, and pretty small chips, even though we've got a much bigger business today, on some things that are not what I would determine core. Right. So after Cerebellum, we, uh, you went over to Hooked on Phonics. Well, I did Mikulski first. Oh, Mikulski's which, campaign. Yeah. And then you got... And then Hooked you, on Phonics. And then Hooked on Phonics. So... Um, it worked for me. 1-800-ABCDEFG. Yeah, yeah. So I have a child who had some learning issues, and... I'm a big fan. So, can great you talk product. a little bit about your great product. So, how did you find it? You know, how did so that's you, a whole uh, interesting story. So, another what did you do over there? Well, you know, an the incredible, we raised? truly incredible local uh, local. If you define uh, Baltimore, Washington, 
uh, local entrepreneur called Chris Owen Sarek was uh, co-founder of what was called Civil Learning Systems. Uh, so Doug Becker and Chris Owen Sarek, anyone in, ed in education technology knows both those names. And uh, Doug took, all, took uh, the higher ed portion of the business and turned it into what is now a $5 billion company known as Laureate. Yes. And Chris was running the K-12 side and brought me in to start a consumer products business. And we were fortunate enough to be able to find an incredible brand that was in the process of dying. Mm -hmm. uh, Hooked on Phonics was California-based and a uh, great brand, truly 99% US brand awareness. Uh, but fascinating brand study in that it had not traveled. And the reason is, the reason all of you know that 1-800-ABCDEFG is Hooked on Phonics is a rare brand that was built 100% on infomercial. Mm -hmm. And infomercials don't travel. I mean, they are truly confined to wherever they were run. And so incredible brand awareness here and almost none anywhere else. So the strategy was instead of creating a consumer products division within this K-12 conglomerate, was to go out and buy this brand and take it to the world in retail. That's exactly so what we did. So you bought the brand. We as bought it was the brand, dying. and the infomercial was dying, and we took it to retail and took it worldwide. Did you raise capital along the way? Um, so I, the, the what was then a joint sort of company put a lot of capital in. Okay. So it was not uh, not externally raised capital like my first and then my third to you, where it was truly you know venture capital. Right. And how long were you at Hooked on? Uh, I was there four years. I left Hooked on Phonics to start to you, which at the time was known as Tudor. And I can so explain. So why that. did you leave Hooked on Phonics? That sounds like a cool gig, and you're doing great. Yeah, things. Yeah. You know, um, so uh, it was a cool gig, um, and you know, uh, uh, frankly, we were pretty captivated with this whole notion of. It just didn't make sense to us, a small group of people, that the world didn't have elite online degrees. Uh, we just didn't understand it. We thought that the technology was there to build something that could be transformative. Uh, but this was really not a story of technology. This was the story of a will of a great institution. By the way, very proud to have one of our partners, Georgetown, here because Without USC and Georgetown, two you wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And um, were they is, your first two? They're our first customers, two. And clients. really, uh, Jeff here from Georgetown. But the the reason that, that it, it's so important to understand that while te what, while technology does power the entire thing, yes. and we're a bit of an Intel inside, one of the reasons that we're one of the more under the radar IPOs really is we are not front and center. You know, Georgetown is important, not to you. Right. Uh, but it's really about the will of a great institution. I mean, we went to USC and we said, you know what? If you desegregate these online students and you make them real Trojans and you give them the same degree and you have the same quality faculty and the same rights and therefore same responsibilities and we don't have a platform and Lehman's collapsing and we can't raise money and it's a tiny little team of us. And by the way, I'd and like what, more what than half. Did you start? Wait, yeah. I didn't finish. I'd like more than half your revenue, please. <laughs> that was the story, and it was 2008, and they said yes. And it's insane. It makes no sense they said yes, right? I mean, I, I'm asking for more than half their revenue, and I have no track record. And fortunately, USC and Georgetown believed in the idea, and that's one of the reasons why, for young entrepreneurs, it's so important that you, do, you, know, you if you really believe, you, you don't take the no, because we couldn't even, I mean, fortunately, we ended up getting funding in 2009. But 2008 was, you know, super difficult time to launch a company with, you know, Lehman going out and the world going to hell in a handbasket. So basically, we had gotten to a point where the belief was there that you could build something great, and we've been pretty darn focused on that same missions for now seven years. Right, and you guys are in a great spot right now. We'll get to the current state, but when you started, it was a tough year, brand new concept. No one had probably ever thought of it, right? You probably had some cool technology, and you had this great vision. But you started in 08. How did you survive you know, the, the initial days? Uh, were there dark days in the first couple oh, of Oh, yeah. Days? I mean, I can give you a couple of existential yeah. moments. But yeah. the, the one that um, I'm most uh, fond of sort of today is my current COO and president, who had made a lot of money in his past life. I used to joke with people internally that I just want to grow up to be Rob Cohen because as a, um, as a, as a three-time entrepreneur, those first two really didn't create any wealth for me. And the money doesn't get me up in the morning at all. That's not why I do what I do. But, it, but it, 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 it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's su su super helpful, right? right. So um, Rob had made a lot of money in his past life. And there were a couple of moments early on. He paid two payrolls. Uh, and one of them was you know over 80 grand. You write a check for 80 grand to keep a company going when you're the 
at the time CFO, huge set of cojones, obviously. So um, really imp impressive and uh, at that moment, you know, he couldn't have believed more. And today, he's still, we've run the company together since really the early days. So that was a critical moment. There, and there, there are moments like that in every startup. That's classic startup stuff. Now it all seems so obvious. At the time, it wasn't at all. And uh, we feel fortunate that we built the kind of culture of people that are just committed to the mission. And that's really what this is about. It's not about the fact that we're doing really well post-IPO and yay, yeah. the share price is good. That's all nice. But it's about driving the right outcome for students that are in these programs. And I feel like that's where online education particularly has not served us well as a country is that you know, people sort of forgot that it's not about the enrollment, it's about the outcome. Correct. And how many universities did you call on until you got your first one? Um, and how long did God. you, from the beginning until you signed USC, what was that time Well, it took, a, I mean, it did take us until mid-2009 to really get going with USC, and then Georgetown came in early in 2010. What's interesting about 2U is I would say we didn't talk to as many as you would think, um, and that in some ways even extends to today. And the reason is um, we say no much more often than we say yes. Mm -hmm. 2U invests you know, between five and 10 million of net negative cash over the first you know, three years of a degree relationship, and our contracts are no shorter than 10 years. So we are funding the programs as well. And so it has to fit the investment thesis, and it won't often for a couple of reasons. One is because the market opportunity may not be right on that particular degree offering, and two is, and more importantly, is because the leadership team at that particular university is really not right to launch it. And um, that's where I give a huge amount of credit to, to Georgetown, as an example, of having the right combination of, of you know, will and, and really leadership to sort of push through the internal battles. I mean, the story of change in higher ed is the story of the turtle being mugged by two snails. You know, somebody asked the turtle what happened. He said, I don't know. It all happened so fast. I mean, it's a, it's a slow process. <laughs> so you know, it, it takes time. And they fought through it. And the fact is, um, you know, we weren't talking to that many. Now, uh, today, we get this question all the time. So I've just, I'm in the middle of a gauntlet right now. I did, like last week, I did, I did Minneapolis, Dallas, Houston, Kansas City, New York, Seattle, Denver. Wow. So we're trying to bracket the investor stuff in one block so it doesn't entirely consume You're my You're bracketing life. your meetings between Dolphins games. Too, that's right? true. I mean, that was convenient. <laughs> so that's how I ended up in right. Denver. But, uh, you know, I have my priorities. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but uh, where, was, where, where was I going with that? Uh, you that were just good. saying, you're talking about your, your, um, your being selective, basically. Oh, yeah. Your, so your, we get this question all the time. Yeah. And it is, it's not the kind of pipeline that, you know, it's, we, we were comped. One of the challenges as a public company is there's no perfect comp for two of you. We were the first of our kind. That was really hard. And so we were closest comp was SaaS. And in SaaS, investors are completely obsessed with pipeline, 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 pipeline. Yeah. And our pipeline, we're not trying to start with 1,000 universities and get down to a small number. You know, we are super selective about who we even talk to, frankly. And I don't say that with hubris or, or say that because we think we're the cat's meow. Like, it doesn't work for a lot of schools, it, this model. It's not going to work. They're not going to drive the right opportunity. And if I'm going to put $10 million in, it has to be the right opportunity. So you're um, taking a... I'll take this the wrong way, but if I had to draw some kind of a metaphor, you're sort of like a VC. You are investing capital in an opportunity, and you're hoping to uh, yield some results. So do you take, if you were taking that approach, what are the sort of key due diligence factors you look at when you're selecting what programs to take? So I'd say the biggest innovation over the last uh, three years is that question uh, totally appropriate. We are funding these programs. And you think about it in 2008, 2009, from a venture capital standpoint, one of the reasons that I give Redpoint, uh, Novak Biddle, local VC, and Highland and Bessemer a lot of credit, those were our four VCs. We raised 102 million of venture capital, a lot of venture capital. And um, you know, it really took a, a pretty massive commitment of faith, even from the VCs, because to find a model where you're effectively funding to fund as well, pretty, pretty complicated. Yeah. Um, so we were obsessed with putting more data behind the selection process. And we built an algorithm that 
basically took the entire IPEDS database, every degree for every school in the country published by the Department of Ed, and mapped it backwards to our enrollment experience to try to determine how, why we were getting enrollment in various places. And remember, you're not dumbing down these universities' brands. These are students that are of the quality of a Berkeley, a Northwestern, a USC, a Georgetown. And so that algorithm has been key to the last two years. Um, it helps us, it drives, I now have an enrollment prediction for any school in the country if I take them online with any degree. Uh, it's only US, that's one of the limitations of it because the data set is the US, but we think the lessons learned in it actually apply internationally. So, um, you know, that huge focus for us in trying to put more data into the process of program selection. So given like, the just fact give us a little taste, like what types of things are you looking for when you're selecting programs? Well, you, you know, you need to have a program that can get to some scale. Um, you know, the internet doesn't do small well, so uh, by definition, the scale improves the quality of the program. And what's fascinating is one of the, one of the concerns you'll hear in higher ed a lot is scarcity and quality, you know, it's, but you're going to dilute the brand and, you know, B schools prove exactly the opposite. The top 10 B schools are all substantially bigger than 11 through 30 and frankly Harvard is the biggest and often considered the best and those extra 750 students aren't hurt in Harvard. Yeah. So I'm not trying to get schools 20,000 students, I'm trying to get schools an extra five, seven hundred, a thousand students and in doing so we make them a lot stronger. So if you look at our track record, our early schools are all substantially larger. Uh, you know, Georgetown, in the case of Georgetown Nursing, a uh, really high quality program before we got there. Unbelievably right. high quality, but small, 50 students. Now there's 1,000 in it. So, you know, it's a it, kind of growth that has really benefited that particular institution without in any way sacrificing quality. The, uh, you mentioned dilution of the brand. So, can you speak to that a little bit? I know, you know, universities sometimes think, think like snails or turtles, but how did you, how do you give them comfort that you know, they're, that they're not going to lose any. You know, Georgetown's, you know, right, platinum, blue chip. How, how do you give them comfort? It was that, a lot harder in the early days. Yeah. You know, you, we didn't have a track record. Today, you know, we can point to, um, you know, our overall retention rates right now, 84%. You look at that kind of retention in an online program, that's more akin to a campus program. So just to compare, Stanford's four-year undergrad graduation rate is 80. They don't get to 90 until they get to six years. So it's 84% is exceptionally high. Most online programs you find are very small. Uh, I can talk about job placement outcomes in the high 80s, low 90s. I can talk about net promoter scores. We're really, we're kind of obsessed with net promoter scores. I don't know if you're familiar with that metric, but it's a very high bar of customer satisfaction. So all great consumer products companies use it to gauge whether or not somebody's ultimately satisfied. And the key question is, would you recommend this thing to a friend? Could be something trivial like a Coke, or it could be something really important like a doctor. And uh, net promoters are pretty high bar. And our net promoter scores right now are better than the iPad and Netflix. So wow. really strong. And I would say one of the things we got right is we did not sacrifice quality for efficiency ever in the early days. Like we convinced our board there'd be this long-term correlation between our financial success and the student outcomes. And they believed it and we stuck to it. And there were some really tough years where we were losing a lot of money and it wasn't obvious. But the fact is that long-term correlation is definitely today proving clear. If you look at our Q3, you know, not only are we growing faster than we, ha we ever have, we've got a, not, not, a, not we ever have, we're growing fast. And we, uh, you know, third quarter Q, Q3 on Q3, 60% improvement in adjusted EBITDA. So like the, there's a real fundamental deceleration of our loss, which is pretty unusual as a SaaS comp. What you find with the SaaS companies is as they keep growing faster, they actually lose more. So we're pretty excited about where the company is today, but it's all about focusing on that student quality. In the right, end. and and I've heard that uh, I've heard you talk about the program itself. It's not just taking a course. It's yep. you're trying to recreate online, the offline, the campus experience. Right? Not not just academically, but talk a little bit about the other parts of uh, your service offerings. I should have started with just a description of 2U. So yep. uh, we partner with top colleges and universities to build what we believe are the world's best online degree programs. More and more, we're challenging people to find something online or offline that's better in all of higher ed. We actually think doing it this way is exceptionally high quality. So we talk about five pillars behind a 2U driven experience. The first is high quality course content. So if you're gonna make a movie out of a play, you would never consider putting a camera at the back of the theater because you would just have a crappy movie. So you make a movie, not a play, right? It's a different modality. So build high quality content with great faculty for that medium. But it doesn't stop there. The second pillar is you go to class. 
So once a week, you are live. Our environment, we, we, our metaphor we go with is no back row. It looks like the Brady Bunch. So you are live with average class size, even though today we're at over 10,000 students, average class size is 10.8. So I challenge you to find something on campus that's that intimate. So you are live with your faculty member once a week. Uh, and it could be an hour and a half, could be two hours, depends on the university. And it's super intimate. I mean, there is truly no back row. So we love that metaphor. It took us a long time to come up with something that would sort of encapsulate the product experience. And we all know the back row. Everybody knows the back row. The seats closest to the exits, forgive me. Uh, refuge for minds that wander, home of the unraised hand. What if you could eliminate that back row and bring every student forward? That's our marketing yeah. to cover. So, but that, we think it's very true. Like, it really does put every student in the front row. And you have to come prepared with that content before you go to class, right? And that's the first two pillars. The third pillar is probably the most important. It's the network. It's a real network. These are Trojans, Tar Heels, and Hoyas. They are not master's graduates. They are becoming full members of the university community in every way. And that takes willpower from this guy and from people like him on campus. That is really hard to do. So most online programs, they're completely desegregated. And so we feel like we're ending the segregation. And the final two are real world experiences. So as an example, in our Georgetown program, one of our degrees is a Master of Science in Midwifery. Midwifery. Try doing that online. So you, you don't want to go to the midwife that you know, delivered the virtual baby, right? You've got to deliver the babies. So 2U uses our technology and our boots on the ground to find a local placement for you anywhere in the United States so you can do your clinical placement in Oregon. And then we find a preceptor that's approved by the Georgetown faculty that's trained on the other part of the SAS solution to represent Georgetown. And we become convinced over the years that that's a big moat around the business because no one else can touch it. So we're doing a lot of programs today that have that real world experience because it's a really difficult thing for people to pull off. Right. And then finally, the fifth pillar is just white glove support. We have an office in Hong Kong for a reason. You just have to support students on their time, on their time zone, and support faculty the same way. You talked about willpower. So I have a question regarding the internal politics of a university. You know. President DeJoya, Jeff, you know, what, how do they manage the reputation? So, you know, in terms of getting the professors on board, the provost on board, the, it's hard. you know, you know do people, the professors respect the program the same way they would sort of a traditional? Biggest challenge for 2U, whether it be with student recruitment, which is part of our job, or university recruitment, is preconceived notions of online education. Right. The reality is all of you in this room, most of you, I should say, would be aghast if you, if you knew that the person next to you was in an online program. You would immediately think that it's a negative. So as an example, on the IPO Roadshow, sort of fascinating, um, the, first me the first thing you do is you go and you pitch the bankers, the sales force that's going to go out and talk about the company. And in that meeting at Goldman Sachs, who took us out, a woman stood up at the end, executive vice president, came in and gave me a hug. And the reason she gave me a hug is she was in our MBA at UNC, our Chapel Hill Top 20 B School. And the reason she gave me a hug is this is whole story is I'm in that program. So I, 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 I want to explain that. I don't want to be alarmed. I'm a three-time CEO. I don't need my MBA. But I am indeed in the program, and I'm happy to talk about that. And she gave me a hug. And the reason I tell the story is you could tell, even though that they're going to take us out, that the other bankers in the room are kind of shocked that somebody that's that accomplished at Goldman Sachs is in an online program. I deal with that every day. Now, we happen to believe when you start thinking long term, about higher ed and about online education, as more and more people figure out that this is not only good, but it's probably better, that's going to change over time. And we think that puts a lot of wind at the back of the company. And what we love about our early adopters is we think we're really helping them sort of reshuffle the deck of higher ed. If, if the 1800s was about Cambridge and Oxford and the 1900s was about the US Ivy League, we really believe that the next 50 years is really going to be about schools that take this seriously and do it really well. Uh, and you know, Chapel Hill is a good example. Doug Shackelford, the dean of that B school, you know, he's 600 students already in that program that are just exceptional. The people in these programs, I'm not nearly as much of a unicorn as you would think. You know, the head of the ER of Southeast General DC Hospital is in the program. The general counsel of the Charlotte Bobcats is in the program. These people are people that want their MBA for a variety of reasons to accomplish their personal goal, and they don't want to pick up their life, quit their job, and move. But they get to be a full member of the Tar Heel Network, and they get the exact same degree that you would get if you were sitting on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. And that, we think, is really powerful. Was it hard to convince your board 
to allow you to get an MBA? Yeah, it was a real talk. So the first thing was my wife. Um, <laughs> You're working 80 hours a week so already. So I'm working a lot. And, I mean, and, but look, I have a life and you know, I have two boys, 12 and nine. My wife and I have been together 24 years. She's seen me through every one of these adventures. So, yeah. you know, she, I mean, she would be a more fascinating interview than me, believe me. But uh, so I t had to convince her first and then my board second. And it was a real board conversation because I am busy. So they limited me one class a term. And what I love about even that is it says a lot about the flexibility. Like, why should the degree not be flexible for you? Mm -hmm. Why should you have to be flexible for it? And so Chapel Hill believed in that. So I've now been in the program for two years. Um, you know, I didn't do it for the hair club for Men Effect. I didn't do it to eat my own dog food. I did it for me. We didn't do any press on it. Recently, we've started to get press on it because the funny thing is I was in a B school program while going through an IPO, which is pretty unusual. And, uh, you know, obviously couldn't talk about it because of all the mm -hmm. rules uh, from an SEC standpoint. But so today we're starting to get more press uh, around it, but that's not why I did it. And I cannot say enough about the quality. It, to the point where the reason we drove no back row, that sort of marketing metaphor, is once I was in, I was so, I'm the CEO of the company, and I was so stunned at how good it was, even though I was the one selling it before. Right. Like, it's that good. These programs are exceptionally high So the dog food quality. does taste good. Dog food tastes good. <laughs> In the beginning, I had a list of, so that I was trying to do this whole thing where I'd have my notes and I would have my to you list. And within three weeks of the first class, which was accounting, I had to give, it a, I had to give up the to you list. It was way too damn hard. Wow. So, uh, you know, I mean, I've run three companies and I've read a lot of balance sheets, but I had never compiled one, right? So uh, it was really challenging and uh, has been pretty remarkable. The network of people in these programs across the board, not just in our B schools, but in our social work program at USC, for instance, like the quality of the students are exceptional because you really are unleashing a university from its physical constraints. We do want to open it up for questions. I have a couple of final or other questions for you. Um, so Professor Clayton Christensen up at Harvard made a bold prediction recently. He said half of the universities will, in the next 15 years, go bankrupt like bankrupt. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that legit? I mean, no. Uh, and then, and then, you know, are you a savior to some of these universities? Yes. Yeah, somebody and said to where us, where are we going with this? You know, somebody said to us, um, you know, you guys are like the arms dealer to the good guys. And I, I didn't, I didn't like the reference because I don't believe that a distinction of being nonprofit or for profit should dictate anything about you being a good guy or a bad guy. I happen to believe that America has been built on private enterprise and on on the market, but uh, we are helping great schools do what they do exceptionally well. And the thing about great universities that I feel like gets lost is even in the turtle and the snail uh, comment that I made earlier is it is it is funny. It's a it's a it's a pithy line that one of my deans gave me. But the fact is, great universities are so unbelievably incredible. I mean, they are just people don't. It's easy today to sit and and poke fun at them, but we don't have companies that last this long. Mm -hmm. Like, so we, we're, we've been made brand stewards of some of the best brands in the world. And we, we're very, very thoughtful about it. Why? So just give you an analogy. Coca-Cola is the second best known English language word in the world. It goes hello and then Coke. Mm -hmm. So Coke, you, you can't tell me it's not a top five brand worldwide. That's an incredible brand. Coke was founded in 1886. Georgetown, Chapel Hill, 1789. They have 100 years on Coke. Like, you're talking about deep brands. And with the word brand, people get a little nervous in higher ed when you say brand because people immediately think marketing. Brands, in my opinion, great brands, whether it be Apple, Google, they're about relationships more than they are about marketing. And so these brands have been around so long and have done so many things so well that, and we, look, we play, we clearly play at the elite level. And it's not because, you know, as a, as a, as a first generation college student, good Lord, I am certainly not an elitist. But the fact is, we do play at a level of university that I am in no, wor in no way worried, in no way, about Georgetown going out of business. And the reason is, if you get a great degree at Berkeley or Georgetown today, you, you do exceptionally well, exceptionally well. So, and actually, interestingly, the Wall Street Journal just published a story that says that the payback period from my generation to kids that are graduating today is now half, even though the cost is that much higher. And so, 
there's a whole argument that can be made at the undergrad level, and we don't play at the undergrad level. We are playing at the graduate level. If you get a Master of Data Science at Berkeley, you do exceptionally well. My concern about the notion of all these schools, the, the notion that, that Clay Christensen supports, is there's a fascinating debate going on at Harvard between Clay and Michael Porter. And for the B school advocates in the room, you know, Michael Porter sort of saying at Harvard, we're Harvard. We don't really need to do anything. And Clay sort of saying, you've got to blow it all up. We feel like the, the horse has left the barn, and because Harvard's not the jockey, nobody's paying attention. But you've got great schools, Berkeley, Georgetown, USC, Wash U, Northwestern. These are all great schools that are jumping on the horse and are going right down the middle of the path. They're not blowing up this fundamentally great thing that they've done, but they are fully disrupting the delivery of it in every possible way. And we think that that means that those that jump on that horse will do really well over time. How long is it going to be until a Harvard, an MIT, a Yale? Gets well, involved either with you. Or you know, we were pretty like excited you. about uh, we were pretty excited about Northwestern. That's a recent announcement for us. Um, you know, you start looking at just undergrad rankings as a barometer of what people would say is quality, which is, frustrates us because you know we could talk about the rankings for an hour. Um, but Northwestern, number twelve in the U.S. News rankings, you know, our highest ranked school, going online with their. Master of Counseling at the Family Institute, which is one of the best counseling schools in the country. And then we also announced Syracuse Newhouse. And while Syracuse is not an Ivy, Newhouse is probably the best school of communications in the country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no offense, but uh, so there are, uh, you know, there are some really, really high quality schools now paying attention. Uh, and we think at all levels, both in the US and worldwide, you will see 2U continuing to sort of tread new ground. Uh, with really high quality schools. Who is your biggest competitor in the future? Right now you're by yourself, you're leading the way. We're well, really not. You know, we're not the no. first to do this either. There's oh. a company called Embinet that was bought by okay. Pearson for about $600 million two years ago uh, that had done this for 13 years. Um, been around a long time. Uh, I would argue a very different premise than 2U. Uh, and what I mean by that is Embinet's trying to bring everybody online. I'm not trying to bring everybody online. I have no interest in bringing everybody online. I'm trying to build the world's best. It's a very different thing. So we bring a lot of technology to the table, we bring a lot of funding to the table, and we scale a program. Uh, Embedded is it's much more of a horizontal play, we're a vertical play. So I happen to think that it's not the same thing. But if you looked at like our analysts on Wall Street, you would see that you know, there are clear competitors. And what's happening right now, uh, and I'm sure there's some venture capitalists in the room right now thinking about it, there's a lot of three U's, four U's, and five U's. Mm -hmm. you know, they're coming. So while we have a great lead, we cannot rest. So my job as CEO, I think you can sum up is drive outcomes by making the bundle of services we provide better and better and better. And that's, you know, that's what we're doing today. Terrific. Love to open it up to some questions for Chip. Um, we have Ray Rice. Come on, Ray. Yeah, uh, Chip, uh, tell us a little bit about the relationship between the professors and the students and how that's so, let's say, good for the professors. So. Um, it's pretty interesting. One of the things that happens early stages of a program is there's a lot of internal resistance. Uh, and most of it comes from faculty members that are really concerned about quality. And what we've learned, and this is a lesson learned, you know, if in the early days we sort of shied away from it, now we go right at it and we give them as much information as possible and show them. There's a great USC quote from our first school where a professor there says that, I see a greater sense of, quote, intellectual intimacy with my online students than I do with the on-campus students. And what you find is, you know, it's, it really is in a class of 11 people or 15 people, you, you'd be shocked how well you get to know these people, and then you do see them. So all of our programs have some sort of real world component, so you see them in person. And so the immersions at Chapel Hill, which I can talk about because I've gone to many of them, you know, you have 400 online students congregating at the Dean Dome, fully in their Carolina blue, to go watch the Tar Heels. And it's, it's just awesome. And then you end up at the Crunkleton, which is an epic bar on Franklin Street, where you're drinking Pappy Van Winkle. You know, it's just the whole thing is just awesome. I mean, not everybody's drinking Pappy Van Winkle. But. So the reason that I bring it up is the relationships are real. There's a really cool Business Week story uh, two weeks ago, if you look up Business Week and you just Google 2U, where there's two students that were in my accounting class, the first one that I told you about. And those two students are now, one was in San Francisco and one was in Chapel Hill. They're now in a relationship that they're publicly saying will be a marriage. And you know, it, it, it happens. So the faculty experience the same thing. They really do build real relationships with these people. April, 
We do have a no asshole policy. Um, you know, it's a, uh, for me, uh, I would say I really appreciate the question. It's one of my personal passions. It's what, it's a big part of what I focus on uh, at the company. Uh, I definitely do work the culture. I think it's, I, I don't care what your good is, whatever you sell, there is no question that you can build something that is bigger. It's about something bigger. It's about being part of something bigger. In our case, it's really easy. We're changing people's lives every day. I mean, the stories that come out of our programs, the Georgetown program, I ended my Q2, every earnings call, even though investors tend to not focus on this stuff, the Georgetown, uh, I, gave, I give a story about impact at the end of every call, and Georgetown just had this crazy moment where a woman in the Georgetown program in Hawaii, now just think about that right there. She's in Hawaii and she's enrolled at Georgetown. In her placement that we arranged, for her midwifery program, she delivered the baby of another student in the program. Oh, wow. So, wow. like, there are crazy stories. So it's easy to be part of that, but the fact is you have to make sure that everybody understands at the company that that's what it's all about. And I had this, uh, I'm a boater, and I had this fascinating uh, moment a long time ago on my boat when I pulled up to uh, this one marina, and if you guys, if there's any boaters in the room, you know, it's a very collegial thing, and I pull up to a marina, and there's this, this really heavy set guy, and we're, we're talking, he's in a little tiny boat, and he says to me, he says to me, he says, the southern draw, we were in Virginia, he says, he says, he's just this super nice guy. And I look at him I'm like, wow, you're like one of the nicest people I've ever met. And he goes, son, every day's a holiday, every meal's a feast. And I said, I said, what? What'd you say? I could barely, he said, every day's a holiday and every meal's a feast. And I looked at him and I thought, that's about the coolest thing I've ever heard anybody say. Like, tell me about that. And he's like, well, I was a grade A son of a bitch for 20 years. Ran a funeral parlor. This is a true story. He said, ran a funeral parlor. He said, I had a heart attack, sat in a hotel bed for, I mean, sat in a hospital bed for four weeks. All I could do is count the ceiling tiles. You count the ceiling tiles for four weeks, and I'll tell you right now, you better damn believe every day is a holiday, every meal is a feast. And what his, me his message to me was, don't let that be the moment when you take that seriously. And so what's amazing about 2U is we have this incredible group of people that it's, we're up to 779 people. And this incredible group of people who really come in every day and they lean towards yes, they don't let the skeptic win, and they really believe in what we're doing. And that whole notion of holiday feast, I think, really comes across in every single interaction most of the time. I and mean, no company is perfect, but we've really tried to work that. So there's a bunch of fun things to the culture. We do these things called spontaneous dance parties. Um, they're unannounced, and when they happen, you just wouldn't believe it. You had actually have to see it to believe it, but it's, it's an amazing 30 minute, super intense dance party of all ages. I know everybody's probably saying there's no way, but it happens. <laughs> and, uh, and I've got ringers that help me make sure everybody gets going. But um, it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. So just wh why not have fun while you're doing it? Oh, Annie? Sorry. So <coughs> BA, <coughs> excuse me, BA from Wellesley 30 years ago, Wharton MBA 20 years ago, that all made sense, that whole model. Time frame. I'm mentoring some 16 and 17 year olds these days. I'm just not feeling the traditional model and all the debt and everything. Sure. And I've been fascinated with online, so listening to your story, I'm your, I'm your friendly face in the audience. I'm like, wow, 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 this is great. What do you say to parents who are just so boxed in with, we're prepared for another lifetime of debt, which I don't get that, and we can't get our heads wrapped around online? Did, well, did everyone hear that question? So the question was, uh, sum it up, is, is what do you say to parents and, you know, given the debt burden and given that, you know, she's not feeling that the model of today's higher education is foot in the bill. So here, here's the tricky answer. Remember, I focus on graduate programs, not undergrad. Undergrad is going through and will continue to go through a transformation. There's no, there's no question. I do not believe it means that the result will be half of our colleges go out of business. My personal opinion, I could be wrong, but I strongly don't believe that. There's actually a gentleman here, Rich Kochman from General Assembly, which if you don't know that company, is a great company that's a good example of where ed tech is going that I think is fascinating and will, like that's a real business, a strong business run by people that I happen to really like, uh, of sort of post liberal arts training in skill sets that drive immediate job growth. So coding is an example. And today's universities are starting to adapt without question 
and many of the elite, the elite schools, and this may not happen at Wellesley, I, you know, I can't speak to Wellesley specifically, but I can tell you as an example at USC, where they just created an academy that Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre, believe it or not, funded, that is basically an academy to take three principal science, three principal totally distinctly different fields, coding, technology, uh, business, and fine arts, and put them together, those graduates will be exceptional. I'd hire those people in a heartbeat. So higher ed, I believe, is starting to adapt. Um, fundamentally, you know, in two use business, it's pretty simple. That you go to a top 20 B school and it, it's the, the numbers are really obvious. You drive a really high quality outcome. You graduate from Georgetown's advanced practice nurse program and become an acute critical care specialist. You're replacing the doctor in many circumstances, particularly in managed care, growing like crazy. So for us, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious. Undergrad is, is going to take time and it is complicated and I would advise, you know, like my kids to, even though I was a liberal arts major, to get that formal training while also taking business classes. To me, it's pretty obvious. Uh, or coding. And there's a lot of interesting ed tech companies focusing on that specifically. Great example of a company that you've never heard of that is of 2U size. They're not public yet, but they're certainly on their way. Is a company called Pluralsight that does, uh, they're Salt Lake based, so it's one of the reasons they're not as well known. They're not in the Valley or in, or in New York. And they do, um, they do basically tech training and a uh, brilliant company. And you know, that, that's a real need. So I don't have the perfect answer for you from the 2U side only because we don't today do undergrad. Now I will tell you, we did a fascinating experiment in undergrad that is the one real thing we've done in the seven years of 2U that failed. And it was called Semester Online. Completely bold, ambitious idea to get great universities to share credit. Uh, and it was 10 incredible schools. I mean, Wash U, Emory, BC, Notre Dame, mm -hmm. Trinity College, Dublin, University of Melbourne, Australia, I mean, incredible schools. Duke was initially in it, then pulled out. And uh, really difficult, and it taught me a bunch of lessons that probably are far too long to talk about right now, about the complexity of what's going on in, higher ed, in undergrad. You, you don't underestimate the importance of that, of, of your daughter being part of something bigger, being part of something that ultimately has the impact on her that GW had on me. I mean. It, there's more going on there. And also people love to say the degree, oh, the degree is antiquated. Total nonsense. The degree is a cost of entry item today. It's a cost of entry. If you're at Google, people love to say, oh, you can go to a tech academy and work at Google. Come on. Google, are you kidding me? You need the coding and the degree from Stanford or Berkeley. So it, uh, the story of the demise of the degree, we think, is way overplayed. Oh, sorry, you're in Yep, you're no, driving. go for it. Yeah, David, just to go off uh, my list. Um, a lot of the discussions in panels like this one are about differences between distance learning programs and the local programs and which is better and which isn't. But really with uh, machine analytics, smart machines, cognitive computing on the horizon, the, the difference between digital content and hard copy is growing greater and greater. Are you looking down the road for what the implications are of this technology as it's emerging on uh, your programs? Sure. Uh, so my, you know, my CTO has built what I think is soup to nuts, uh, the most, uh, the strongest overall ed tech stack in the country, and it's complicated because it's not just the front end that people like the the the, the part that you referenced is the sexier part. It's the part that people like no back row. You know, you're all together and the learning analytics behind it and what we're learning about why students progress or don't progress and how much data we have that a campus would never have. It's true, you know, I have, I'll give you an example. I have a permanent recording of every live class ever taken. Hmm. And as a student in a 2U program, I personally can go back and watch week four of accounting tonight if I want to and see the actual archived recording. And by the way, 10,000 students across our portfolio and I don't have a single server. Why would I have a server? It's all in the cloud. So the front end is what people talk about. Our tech stack, one of the reasons it's so complicated, is we built this comprehensive back end to run the university. Because these students are real Hoyas. They're real Trojans, right? So they've got to be fully integrated. That's hard. Uh, the placement network, that's hard. So we are continuing to make our bundle better. And I would say learning analytics is a piece of the platform today where you will see 
some of the most advanced characteristics into you over, let's say, five years. There's no question. Companies like Newton, I don't know if you know Newton, K-N-E-W-T-O-N, a New York base run by a good friend of mine, uh, really at the forefront of adaptive learning. Uh, it's real. Now, in the case of a high-quality data science program at Berkeley, where you've got eight people in a classroom with some of the most brilliant people literally in the country, it's tough to be, frankly. You know, it's eight people. It's 11 people. And you're being really mentored by incredible people. The reason that we used to be called Tutor and we changed our name to 2U is that I became very uncomfortable over time announcing ourselves as Tutor because people presumed we were doing the teaching. Mm -hmm. And we will never do the teaching. This is a Georgetown program, not a 2U program. I think we have time for one more. Dennis? There's been some bad press on some of the profit-making uh, education outfits like the University of uh, Phoenix and Corinthian and the company owned by the Washington Post. Has that impacted you at all? It's tough. You know, preconceived notions of online education are hard. Uh, so anytime anything online gets a bad rap, it's not great for 2U. Uh, at the same time, people don't apply to Berkeley and Strayer at the same time. So it's, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a very different market. Um, we would prefer that everybody was doing better uh, because it would be better for us. I really think that if you look at our long-term models, one of the hardest things for the company to gauge is we believe that there's a lot of wind at our back uh, in sort of the macro trends. And one of them is this whole notion of online education becoming more obvious to people like you. Um, so, you know, Corinthian being in the, in the paper, it, it doesn't help, but it's not directly impactful to us. You know, we don't have the same baggage that, that the for-profit universities have, because I am not a university. You know, this is Northwestern, not, not to you. I have one more yeah, it was last a, question. It was a bit, I don't want to end on No, you. we're going to end with, uh, I have a question for oh, you. Okay. Aside from focus, if you had to give one piece of advice from your learning and experience to everyone in the room, what would it be? Well, I mean, this room doesn't need my advice. To the young entrepreneurs, uh, you know, don't let the skeptic win. Build a culture of people that lean towards yes. The thing about leaning towards yes, I, where I heard this is I had this, this admiral in the Navy who had literally 80,000 people under his command, and he said to me uh, three rules. He had three simple rules. He said, do the right thing, obviously very important. Love your sailors, which I think you know, extends to our culture, and lean towards yes. And I thought it was so powerful and so simple, and it's really difficult to build a culture of people that think that way, particularly as you get, like my biggest concern of 2U today versus 2U three or four years from now is, you know, I think we have something like 80 open jobs right now and we're up to almost 800 people. A lot of hiring going on. And as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, making sure we maintain that notion of, of not doing it the way we did it because Chip said that's the way we did it. Like, that's not the reason to do it. We did it that way because we were making it up, not because we were the smartest people in the room. And God bless, it worked but continue to make it better and have a group of people that will lean towards the answer of yes. It's really hard. It's easy to go no. It's hard to get to yes. Uh, and then holiday feast, you know, because life's too short, right? So mm -hmm. don't wait till you're counting the ceiling tiles. On that note, I'd like to thank you for, for your time. No problem.